is it alive or is it not alive? What makes something alive is if it grows and multiplies, it's alive. Viruses cannot grow or multiply on their own. They have to find a cell, they penetrate the cell, and then they use the DNA of the cell to copy themselves. Otherwise, they can't just multiply on their own. That's truly something interesting, you know, this creation of viruses. Scientists are saying the same time the first cell developed or was created is the same time the virus developed as two different branches of life. Viruses, viruses versus everything else. Everything else have a cell except a virus doesn't have a cell. It's just like, it's, a, it's just the DNA. It's just the program of a cell that needs a cell to copy itself and multiply. So that's why it runs from one person to another to copy itself and multiply and spread. Subhanallah, truly. Uh, it's a code. It's a program. And uh, it's interesting how a small program, even when, when we have a code or a program that uh, disrupts our computers, we name them also a virus. That's the first thing. The second thing, the question that comes, is this uh, in the large picture, is this a punishment from Allah to all humanity, to all of us? The answer to that question is we don't know. Why? Because the same thing could happen to two people. Maybe these two people are brothers, like blood brothers. To one person, the same thing, it's a punishment, and to the other person is mercy and elevating their ranks, and it makes them closer to Allah. So is this a punishment, or is this what? Yes, it is a punishment to some people, and it is an elevation to others. Who? We don't know, because Allah does not tell us whom He punishes and whom He has mercy on. This is Allah's business. We will all know on the Day of Judgment. So it's a very important question because people always say, oh, this is a punishment for Allah uh, to whatever was done to Muslims in a certain country or in a certain place or to whatever is done to Muslims worldwide. Well, we have Muslims that contract the virus and die from it. So is it a punishment to them too? So you cannot just apply one principle to everything. It's a, a punishment to some and it is a mercy to others. Our view in Islam, the general view, is when a believer becomes sick, they become closer to Allah. Their dua is mustajab. If they, because of the pain and suffering and the fever that they encounter, it washes them from their sins. It makes them pure. As a matter of fact, when someone visited, visits a sick person, you say what? You say, tahur, tahur. May this be a purification for you, right? for the other believer, meaning your pain and suffering and, and, and anxiety and fever and physical and mental and emotional pain is not gonna go unnoticed. It's not gonna go for no reason or no purpose. This thing is gonna actually purify you, elevate you, make you a better re person. So that for a believer should make you feel good. Or someone else will say, oh my God, why do I have to go through this? Yeah, but if you are a believer and you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, that's the best news that you can have. To someone else, that might some, sound insulting, but for the believer, it's a music to the ears. And um, anyway, at the end of the day, everyone has to die. Everyone gets sick in this world. So that sickness and that pain and suffering, either we can say it's meaningless or we can say it's actually meaningful and it's something that you should reflect upon and use it to get closer to Allah. So in general, big picture, becoming sick for the believer is a good news. Becoming sick for the believer is not something that the believer wishes or make dua, Ya Allah, make me sick. The Prophet ﷺ forbid us from saying that. He said, don't ask Allah for bala. لا تسأل الله البلاء ولكن اسألوا الله العافية Ask Allah for safety and security and prevention and living in good well-being. That's what you ask Allah. You don't ask Allah. But if you get tested in becoming sick, 
or in any other test in life, that is going to be meaningful. It's going to forgive your sins. It's going to make you better. It's going to make you higher. It's going to make you more honorable in the eyes of Allah. And that means your pain and suffering did not go unnoticed. It went fully rewarded. Fully rewarded. So that's a big picture. <clears throat> the other big picture that I want to speak about is that one of the six pillars of Iman is to believe in divine destiny. Al-Qadri khayrihi wa sharrihi min Allah ta'ala. The Qadr, destiny, whatever happens, and in this case, destiny is on a large scale. The good and the bad is from Allah, right? But it's all good for you. Because only good comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the good and the bad is what is coming from Allah, which means the Prophet وسلم, explains that by saying, I'm amazed, I'm amazed at the status of the believer. Everything that happens to him is good. If something bad happens to him, happens to him and he has sabr, it's good for him. If something good happens to him and he has shukr, it's good for him. And that's only for the believer. Another hadith. Prophet Sallallahu said, nothing happens to the believers, pain, suffering. He mentioned even mental anguish, stress, physical pain from hard work or physical pain from stress. Nasab, wala wasab, wala marad, and no sickness happens to the believer. Even when he's walking down the street and a thorn pokes him. You know, if you have one of these lemons or orange or Calamantine trees, uh, tangerine trees, and they have the thorns. You go to pick something, it pokes you. Even that poke, Allah will forgive your sins with it. So what is the general picture for becoming sick in Islam? It is a positive picture. We don't say when a believer becomes sick, oh, Allah's punishing you. We never say that. On the contrary. You make dua to the person, you say, As'alullah al-Azim, Rabb al-Arsh al-Azim, and Yashfiq. I ask Allah the Great, the Lord of the great throne that Allah will heal you. We also ask for complete shifa in the beautiful dua, Rabbin nas idhib al bas O Lord of the people, take the test and take the sickness away. Take the harm away. Ishfi anta shafi, heal, you are the healer. Ishfi anta shafi, heal, you are the healer. Shifa an la yuradiru saqama. A shifa, a healing that will leave no sickness behind. Ya salam, this is, now we're starting to pay attention, no? Because you could heal and get back sick. You want a type of healing that you don't go back to being sick. This is very important. Subhanallah, this sentence, a healing that leaves no sickness behind. Okay, so, another general picture and big thing in this time, this all, the whole fear that we are all feeling, it makes us remember our brothers and sisters who went through or are going through now cancer and treatment, chemotherapy and radiation. Why? As someone who went through that myself for six months, the doctors were telling me what the doctors are telling the public now. Don't shake hands. Don't hug. No kisses, huh? no hugs, no handshakes, okay. Don't get close. Don't go to large crowds. You are walking around with a zero immunity system. Zero immunity. Subhanallah, I used to look at the numbers. You know, the normal number in a normal human being, it's seven point something, right? When it comes to certain white blood cells. I'm looking at my numbers, it's 0.2. <laughs> I don't even have one. So they were saying you're walking around with zero immune system. Subhanallah, I make dua for everyone that went through or is going through cancer and treatment. May Allah heal you. And here is the dua that is amazing. A healing that leaves no sickness behind. What's the most important thing for the doctors after someone goes through chemotherapy? What's the most important thing? is that there is no remission. And they look for the first five years. 
So the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Allah, heal him. A healing that leaves no sickness behind, which means the cancer will not come back to you. Inshallah, it doesn't come back to you. Inshallah, you don't have it, but if you have it, it doesn't come back to you. And if it comes back to you, may Allah heal you again and again and again. And may Allah Azza wa give us sabr. And this is a beautiful dua that we all uh, should know. اذهب الباس رب الناس اشفي أنت الشافي لا شفاء إلا شفاء أو شفاء لا يغادر سقما As we said, inshallah I'm gonna put a link to all of these du'as because people say what is the du'a, what's the du'a? Don't worry, we will put a link inshallah you can access these links both on the WVMA website wvmuslim.org or on uh, Sheikh Al Bakri YouTube channel or Facebook channel they're going to be both posted and the same thing inshallah now having said that that's another general picture qadr is a general picture and it's a pillar of iman and that pillar of iman should come to your rescue right now allah tells us in the quran to say qul qul so we're going to say because allah said qul qul lan yusibana illa ma kataba allah lana say nothing is gonna happen to us except what Allah wrote for us. Everyone knows in English, there is for you and there is to you or against you. To you, I'm going to do that to you. Ah, that's bad harm. I'm going to do that for you. That's good. So Allah said in the ayah, say nothing is going to happen to us. Huh? قُلْ لَنْ يُصِيبَنَا Nothing's happened to us except what Allah wrote for us. Uh, What's going to happen to us? Nothing. What Allah wrote for you. What Allah wrote for you. The good and the bad, the outcome of it is good. So imagine you're walking around with this mentality. If something good happens, it's good. If something bad happens, it's good. You become unbreakable mentally, emotionally. Huh? And now they're saying if you're mentally and emotionally strong, the mental state, they're finding out what we have been saying for hundreds of years is that your mental, emotional, spiritual state affects your physical state. Constantly, 30% of people heal under the placebo effect. The belief that they're going to get better because they're taking a pill, they get better. The other day I was watching a program, they're talking about knee surgeries. Half of the participants, they actually made an actual knee surgeries. The other half, they just drilled three holes, stitches, just stitches. They didn't make a surgery. And the people got better just because they thought they had a surgery. And we're talking about physical, like surgery now. It's very worth to watch that video on YouTube, inshallah. We're coming now to the general picture. This thing is affecting the masses. Okay. So now it's not only affecting people's health. What else it's affecting? It's affecting people's finances. So now you're having the fear test. The fear. Now you're having the um, physical fear that you might get sin, sick, and now you have what we call emotional fear, and now you have the financial fear. Again, your faith will come to your rescue, and I will dedicate a whole video about that, inshallah, so that you can listen to it as you are relaxed. Another big picture is now they're asking people to work from home, inshallah. So now you're gonna, maybe for the first time, spend some really, really long and hopefully quality time with your family, inshallah. So we're gonna talk about like how to take advantage of that. And under that, I want to say something about Salat al-Jum'ah. As we're saying, we're not praying, I'm not giving khutbah, I'm just giving a class. At the time of Salat al-Jum'ah to give people some normalcy and some, you know, love, uh, insha'Allah, and some bind, bonding together as believers, insha'Allah, Rabbil Alameen. But when a person does not have a jami' and a masjid where people pray Jum'ah, if there is a jami' and masjid where people pray Jum'ah, and it's a regular life, you know, regular situation, a person cannot pray Jum'ah at his home. It doesn't, it doesn't work, it doesn't count, it doesn't, it, it's not allowed. But in this case, the masajid are closed for the safety of the community. The masajid are closed for the safety of the community. So now you are at home. So here is something for you. Jum'ah is fard and wajiba on every 
adult man. Allah made it easy for women, but Allah did not make it mandatory. The masjid is open, they can come. Women pray Jum'ah at the time of the Prophet So it's open, it's not closed, but it's not mandatory, right? It's not mandatory on children, right? So if the person, if you have in your household, let's say three adult men, three adult men in which Jum'ah is a haq for them, Obviously, this is a long discussion. What is the number that you need to pray Jum'ah? We have the Shafi'i and Hanbali, they say 40. The easiest one on this is the Hanafi. And within the Hanafi Madhab, there is also schools, the sub-schools. Sometimes the Hanafi scholars uh, disagree with Imam Abu Hanifa because there is a stronger Dalil. But the question is, what is Jama'ah and what is Jama'ah? In Arabic, there's singular, there's dual, and there is plural. Plural in Arabic is three and more. The Prophet ﷺ in hadith says, الراكب شيطان والراكبان شيطانان والثلاثة ركب One traveler alone by himself, shaytan. Shaytan will whisper to him, he can go and do something wrong. Two might plot with each other. Shaytan can easily hunt them. But three is a jama'ah. Another hadith, إن كنتم ثلاثة فأمروا أحدكم. If you are three, and you're traveling, make one as your Amir. Okay. So if we have three adults, and now the discussion between the ulama, do you need the Imam plus three adults or the Imam plus two adults? That is up for discussion. There is within our tradition, as long as there's two people that Jum'ah is fard on them, not the children and not the women, and if there are, Obviously, the children and women should come and attend if they can in the household. But this is a chance for us to pray Jum'ah at home if you have that number. And I say that not to encourage you because once we open the masajid again, inshallah, this pandemic is behind us. It's not allowed to do that anymore at home and pray Jum'ah at your house. So some people might get the wrong idea from this. But nevertheless, I thought... I want to share that with you. What do you need to make Salat al-Jum'ah? You need someone, everyone, you know, at least wudu. And the best thing is to take shower, the ghusl al-Jum'ah, the ghusl, the shower of Jum'ah. The father or the son will stand up. Very easy. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Then you read an ayah from the Quran. Preferably one of the three ayat that talks about taqwa. But you, if you read, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَكُ فَنَ أَحَدٌ And if you want to do an explanation, Allah is asking us in this surah to worship none but Him and to believe in none but one God, Ahad. One and only, one and unique. No one is like Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوَ أَحَدٌ No one is like Him. Ahad means... One, and Ahad means unique, nothing like him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's say someone stand up and say, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, was salatu was salamu ala rasulillah. Qala Allah ta'ala, Allah said, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lau kufa ahad. Then you say, you sit down and you say, that's it. You sit down, that's the first khutbah. You stand up again. And you give the same thing again. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. And you read another ayah. Here you can add a dua. Ya Allah, lift up this trial and tribulation on all of us. Right? Ya Allah, lift this trial and tribulation from Ya Allah, heal the sick. Ya Allah, uh, forgive us all. Have mercy upon us. Ya Allah, like that. So, then that person who gave the khutbah, or even someone else in the family, can lead Salat al-Jum'ah to rak'ah. If you don't have these three to four men, obviously you can check with your mufti and so that people don't go uh, crazy upon this. You can call your mufti on this and say, you know, do we need three plus the imam? That's a very strong opinion. Two plus the imam, two adult men that Salat al-Jum'ah is fard on them, plus the Imam, he's adult, and this and that. 
or uh, or do we go with the 40 plus right that's that's another thing so this way subhanallah we maybe we have a a golden opportunity for training and inshallah we'll dedicate a video for that to teach you and teach your adult children how to give khutbah because maybe the, inshallah they're going to give khutbah in middle school and in high school and in college this is a good chance for them to get a training inshallah rabbil alameen the other thing that i wanted to share is that we as believers are instructed to see the positive in everything something bad happens our minds start thinking what's the positive one of the big things that we have to recognize is just before this pandemic what was the news the news is that our planet is falling apart the north pole and the south pole are melting never ever in our recorded history have we recorded 65 degree in the south pole type this is affecting the fish in the sea the birds in the sky the balance of life the ecosystem you know the people who don't believe in god and they don't believe in religion they keep on talking about karma what goes around comes around the universe will hit you back with it so we did this to the planet the planet is doing that to us right we say you know is the if the universe is dead the universe is not intelligent then the universe cannot hit you back with anything but all what you mean when you say karma you're saying that there is a god even though you don't want to admit it but the fact that you have observed throughout centuries humanity have observed that what goes around comes around that's one of the proofs of the existence of the divine that allah jalla jalaluhu exists so now we've been doing this to our planet is this the planet hitting back allahu alam everything is under allah's control but what is happening one positive side from this the pollution is dropping so significantly because people are starting to work from home and big countries like china and italy and and are on a lockdown what is that causing less omission of cars and airplanes and this in the air one positive thing is coming out of this is what it is the less pollution so maybe we can add that to the list of positivity which is a big thing to me it's a big thing i love nature i love every small and big thing i love how the ecology system works i love how everything is happening so alhamdulillah rabbil alameen we are um we, we we really should think of that and we should reflect on how do we change our habits of driving and throwing garbage and garbage at the planet maybe this is a chance to repent to allah from harming his creation in islam allah said in the quran subhanahu wa ta'ala that these birds and these ants and bees and this are umamun amthalukum are nations like you they make tasbih they pray to Allah, they have understanding. And if you harm them, it's not okay. This is our job on earth is to, to be vicegerent and to be representatives and to be God's guardians of this planet. This is our job. We turn around and we do a bad job. It's like imagine your, I don't know, your dad or mom gave you a gift, a house so that you can live in it. Next thing, you walk inside the house and you keep on punching holes, punching holes, and water is running and damaging the house and you're not paying attention until the house collapses on your head. Who does that? Except someone who has lost his intellect. So that's why one positive thing that is coming out of this and one point of major point of reflection is to actually look at the planet and give the planet a break. May Allah Azza wa Jal save all of his beautiful creation. And inshallah, we're not the reason why so many species are going to go extinct. You know, extinct. You know, it's a, imagine if another species do something to the planet and as a result, all human beings die. We will be making dua against that thing like there is no tomorrow. Because there will be no tomorrow. <laughs> so that's the idea that I wanted to reflect. One positive thing is less pollution. 
Another positive thing is that this thing, any believer, any believer, it's turning them back to God. Please, God, help me. Please, Ya Allah. Humanity is making dua today like they've never done before. We need to find the positive and the negative, right? Another thing, in Islam, we have something called halal and haram. And usually, haram needs large gatherings, you know, and people hanging out together and, and this and that. We have red lines in Islam. So lots, haram is going down because people are not meeting each other to do haram. So <laughs> that's maybe one positive thing in the negative news that is going around. Another positive thing, doctors tell us, some way, somehow, this thing is not affecting people who are 15 years and younger or pregnant women. SubhanAllah, that's a positive news in the middle that someone is spared at least, SubhanAllah. Most of the people who are dying are in their old age. Um, another positive news, people right now started paying attention to this ibadah that we've been practicing since we were little kids, which is the ibadah of wudu. And inshallah, we will dedicate a whole video to that to show you how interesting, how interesting is this. So I like to always do experiments. And what I do is I have my phone, I have the stopwatch and I click stop, go. If you do wudu properly by washing your hands up to here, properly three times and you read the sunnahs about that subhanallah the sunnah of the prophet is to wash the hand from the bottom and from the top and then there is the other sunnah which is التخليل بين الأصابع he used to do like this one hand above the other to do this right and to what we call rub them really hard right with the water so imagine doing that three times, you're talking about 10 seconds, right? And we're gonna display that. And then the second time, and then after that, what are you doing? You're washing your mouth. And one thing most of the ulama in all the madahib are saying, when you put the water in your mouth, don't just poop and spit it. You gargle it three times. All the bacteria in your mouth, now they're finding the bacteria in the mouth is affecting the heart, right? Your dental health, and hygiene is very crucial and critical to the health of your heart. Imagine. Then you do, right now, what? Your nose. But notice how before you clean your mouth in Islam, you have to clean your hands thoroughly, right? And there is something that the Prophet ﷺ keeps on talking about. Ihsan al wudu. To do wudu with ihsan. Ihsan yani beauty and perfection. Take your time. Don't rush. So I'm just thinking, if we Muslims, every time we want to wash our hands, we have the niyyah with it that we want to, inshallah, complete it and make it wudu. Look at what. They're saying the problem is touching someone or something or doorknob, then touching your eye or your nose or your mouth or your ears, any of the openings in your face. All of these are covered with wudu. First, you wash your hands thoroughly. Then you wash your mouth. Then you wash your nose, right? You, and in the in the sunnah, unless you are fasting, unless you're fasting, you you exaggerate in sucking the water through your nostrils, through your nose, and then blowing your nose with the other hand, with the left hand, very, very hard. Three times. Then you let it out with the other. Total cleansing, total hand, mouth, nose cleansing. Minimum, five times a day. And if you want to do it more, some Sahaba used to love to make just uh, wudu and pray two rak'ah, like Hadrat Bilal ibn Rabah, radiyallahu anhu wa ardah. He used to make wudu and pray two rak'ah. Then you come back and wash your face, and the face is from here to here, and from here to here. This is the legal face, fiqh face, shar'i face. From here to here, from where the hair grows to where, you know, above your Adam's apple. And then from ear to ear. And that's why Rasulullah used to make dua and he has beard. He used to put his hand and make takhleel 
make sure that the water is reaching on the skin behind the beard. And you do that thoroughly, you know, and you run the water on your face. Some people just splash the water. Some people smack themselves on the face. You don't need to do that. You just need to put the water and put it and let it run on your face and rub, rub. Ya salam. And then you come back, you do wudu, again, you start with your hand, you wash your hand again, and then all the way to your elbow and above the elbow, three times. Allah, brothers and sisters, my brother is a physician, and so many of our brothers in the community are physicians, and look and watch uh, physicians, surgeons especially, before they walk into surgery, look how they wash their hands. Subhanak ya Rabb. As if they are making wudu. They do this, they do this, and then they have scrubs, and they scrub all the way to here. Isn't that interesting? Subhanallah. It's really. So this is one of the small details in which you can wash. And they say, if you get out and come back, don't touch anyone else in the family. Go straight to the bathroom and wash your hands before you touch anything. Ya Salam. What a beautiful... Every time we wash our hands, we make the niyyah to Allah that this is ibadah. And what did the Prophet ﷺ say? When you wash your body, you wash your body and you wash your sins. Again, we're going to dedicate a whole episode for that, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. So now, we're looking at, um, from the big picture all the way to the small detail. This is a time that you sit down with your family and read Qur'an. And check on how everyone is reading Qur'an. Maybe someone in the family doesn't know how to read Quran properly. MashaAllah. Let's hire a teacher online. We give jobs for our brothers and sisters from Egypt and Jordan and Syria who are amazing and experts in teaching the Quran. Huh? You give a Muslim a job because you want to make sure that you're reading Quran properly. Let the family sit down together. Subhana Rabbi al -Azim. Let the family make wudu. Let the family wash their hands like Rasulullah Sallallahu used to do before eating. Before you put that, touch that food with your hands and put it in your mouth. The sunnah of the Prophet is to wash the hands. The sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is even actually in the fiqh, it's higher than a sunnah. When you wake up in the morning, before you put your hand in any food, you should wash your hands. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, because you don't know where your hand went when you were sleeping. What did you touch with it? Ya Salah. What a high class deen. So, so many things come to my mind. Um, my also, as communities, um, I want to recommend the masajid to have a system. If you have elderly in the community, if you have people who are sick and cannot leave home, call one another and let's serve one another. Bring food to the elderly. Yes, this is a chance to make a lot of hasanat. Let's make food cook for them or bring them fruits and vegetables this is the time we check upon each other what if we have someone in the middle of all of this that is going through chemotherapy what are we going to make them go and shop themselves and and contract this thing you know, and end up with coronavirus while they're going through chemotherapy uh, believe me brothers and sisters it's not a it's not a good it's not a good feeling it's a you know to to, to have to do that so we have to this is the chance MashaAllah, in our center here at WVMA, we have a, an amazing group of sisters that, MashaAllah, I have known them now for 10, 11, 12 years. We've been having classes together. We wanna, inshaAllah, they are amazing. They have WhatsApp group and they check on one another. And they help one another. We have teachers in this WhatsApp group. That So inshaAllah, we would like to um, uh, continue. So also we have our classes on uh, Saturday, I give a class for women uh, from 10 to 11.30, uh, which we will continue to give, inshallah. And then from 11.30 to 12.30, we have a high school class. Anyway, if you're high school or middle school and you like to attend, you can attend with us online on your phone, on your laptop, and we can find a way that you can ask a question and I can answer your questions, inshallah. So this is a two-way communication, not one-way communication. So may Allah reward you and may Allah bless you. Um, and um, this is why I will end with this. Why did we cancel Salat al-Jum'ah and even 
the five daily prayers. Why? Because this, this virus spreads. 80% of the people don't even show symptoms or very light symptoms. 20% show symptoms. Of the 20%, there's a good chance that this 20% needs hospitalization for six weeks. If the virus keeps on spreading, and those 20% have to be hospitalized, it's going to overwhelm our entire system, healthcare. There will be no beds in the hospital for sick people. And that's when everyone is really going to go on panic. So what, what do you do favor to you, yourself, and your family, and to the society, and to the elderly? Like if you ask anyone, would you kill your father? Would you kill your grandfather? They say, oh, what are you talking about, Sheikh? Astaghfirullah. Of course I would never do that. Well, this thing is not killing the young. If you're young and you don't care, um, good for you, but just you have to care about your parents and grandparents not to give it to them, especially if they are old. Because the median age is like around 65, and people in their 80s is like really fatal for them. So what is the whole point? As a society, we're acting together, making sure that the virus doesn't spread so that the hospitals don't run out of beds very quickly in a matter of three to four weeks. That's actually what's ending up, what ended up happening in Italy, northern Italy. So we don't want to get there. And we don't want to sit and start, you know, put our doctors in harm's way, starting they have to decide who do they treat and who do they not treat because there isn't enough beds or enough treatment. That's why we're acting very quickly to make sure that this doesn't turn into a very, very ugly situation. And our Prophet ﷺ said, you shall not inflict harm on yourself, nor you shall inflict it on others. Also, he said, let's not, don't bring the healthy onto the sick. He said it in even the context of livestock. Don't bring the sick livestock into the healthy livestock. We are more valuable than a livestock. And the problem is the one who's carrying it might not know that he's carrying it. So if you don't know that you might harm your brother or sister or not, then you have an extra precaution and you make sure you're not there to give it to them. So may Allah Azza wa Jal uh, make this go away as fast as possible. I really advise you uh, to you know, stick to your faith, bring the family together, give sadaqat, charity. MashaAllah, I was meeting with our brothers and sisters from the Sima. Uh, there are doctors who go and treat people in Syria on the borders. Subhanallah, yani, what they're saying is that the people on the borders, like they would rather die than go through what they are going through. We want to live. Why? Because if we live, we have a nice situation waiting for us, home, work. But if you are in a situation where if you survive, you're going to even have more pain and suffering. Forget the coronavirus, just more pain and suffering, period. So may Allah Azza wa Jal be there for our brothers and sisters in Syria, in everywhere, Iraq, Afghanistan, wherever there's a, a war in Yemen, uh, in Libya, subhanAllah, all of these bleeding hotspots in Somalia, right? In Africa, people went through the Ebola while we're sitting down here sipping coffee. Now we know what it feels, right? So subhanAllah, it's a lesson for all of us. And it's very sad, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, the most beloved places to Allah are masajid, most beloved places to Allah. It's very sad that we can't go to the masjid and pray now with our five daily prayers. But maybe if we miss it, we're going to know its value. Maybe we're going to come back with so much hunger and thirst that we're not going to miss our masajid and our jama'ah anymore. I miss my brothers and sisters, the people that I used to meet on Saturday after Fajr and have breakfast together. Nothing is like brotherhood, nothing is like sisterhood. I miss these gatherings already, and inshallah it won't be long before we come back again. May Allah bless us all, and inshallah we keep in touch with you. We will try, inshallah, I will try every day to release some video to add, so that you're not left alone with your worst fears. Believe me, brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, there is a way, there is a way, there is a way that you can weather this and surf on the top of the wave, not under the wave. There is a way and Islam is the way, Quran is the way. Allah is our guardian and our helper. And inshallah we stay in touch and we stay in tune. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us the thawab 
and the reward of praying Jum'ah, even though we didn't pray Jum'ah today. May Allah make this Jum'ah a blessed Jum'ah on us, our families, our community, our nation, and entire humanity. May Allah make this day a day of repentance. Brothers and sisters, declare your repentance to Allah. Say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, astaghfirullah, wa atubu ilayh. Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbul afwa, fa'fu anna. I'm going to dedicate a whole uh, video for that, inshallah, so don't worry about it. But these are 20 second repentance, 20 second, like that. You're ready for death, doesn't matter. And inshallah, not you nor all your loved one will die or pain from this. But inshallah, we help the others. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa akhiru da'wana, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad, ala alihi wa sahbihi